Okay. So let's start. What was the hardest part of your PhD when you were doing your PhD? What did you struggle with? Craig, how about you start us off? I had trouble uh, finishing writing it. <laughs> <laughs> Who helped you, Craig? Who got you to over the finish line? Okay, that it was really hard for you, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Um, I don't know. Uh, why, why do you think it was so hard to write it? Um, I don't know. I was just doing it by myself. I, I don't like writing things up. I felt like I was done with it. I was tired of it already. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> ready to move on okay i believe that uh, the hardest part was to get a feeling that you got started i mean finding the first question to, to work on getting any kind of thing that looks like you're doing research that's probably was the uh the hardest part um just you know not not even getting started not even doing research just getting the feeling that you can do research and and uh, uh and do something that's not just a homework exercise so what happened when you felt for the first time that this has happened? What was it? What made you feel that? Honestly, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, at some point there is a question that you think about and you have some uh, ideas of what to do. And then you and, and then I don't think that there was any kind of deliberate thing that I did well. It was a long time ago. I could just <laughs> forget about it. But I don't think that there was anything specific other than just, you know, do the same thing that you do when you do your homework and then, you know, take advanced uh, this and that class and, and think of problems. At some point, one of the problems that you think about or talk about with your fellow students or something uh, is going to be new enough to be publishable. So another question is, how did you find your thesis topic? So Hugo. Um... Move the have, camera so that you're you want you, 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 you want stories? You want yes, stories? anything, anything is good. Um, uh, my advisor, Obed Goldreich, uh, came back from his uh, years in MIT and I met with him uh, because I read some of the papers of uh, uh, Shafi, Silvio, etc. And I, I was impressed with this work. So uh, I, when, when he came back, I met with him uh, together with uh, uh, Oren. Shai, <laughs> Oren who? No. Uh, What's his name? Hey, what's his name? Owen. Oh, and... Anyway, with some other student that actually he was interested in finding a, a, a subject for a master thesis, and I wanted a PhD subject. Um, so uh, he offered um, Yair, Yair, Yair Oren. He offered him uh, some question on zero knowledge, which is now known as the Goldreich Oren uh, result. And uh, he offered me uh, to work on something completely esoteric uh, called um, uh, Oblivious Ram. <laughs> uh, and I thought, and he had this uh, justification of Oblivious Ram uh, for uh, software uh, protection. That was the introduction in the paper. And I thought that it, that was too, too much of engineering too practical for me. Uh, instead, I, uh, I I read the, the I don't know which one GGM. Uh, anyway, they, they had a, a theorem saying that one-way functions uh, imply uh, pseudo-random generators, but that was a definition of one-way function 
as a function that remains one way after anyway, way. Something. So that one was really an, an interesting theoretical question. So I started looking into that. Um, and, you know, let me connect to the previous question that you asked about what's the hardest part. Your PhD is when someone else solves the question that you were supposed to solve. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you get over that when that happens? Well, I was upset for a couple of days, but then I felt liberated. <laughs> I don't have to think about it anymore. Um, uh, so how did you move on? No, I mean, uh, I, uh, I mean, you know, I had a, a partial result. Uh, but uh, yeah, but I was looking. I mean, I I, I I was looking at other problems around, and uh, so. But but uh, it's true. I mean, uh, I was uh, liberated. But, uh, actually, I have a nice story about uh, my master thesis. Yes, that's a very good story for uh, okay. people, for students. Okay. Uh, I I I was giving a, a question by. Uh, Azaria Paz, a professor in the Technion, uh, and I was working on it, and I did some progress, but then, you know, it was hard. I couldn't make more progress, and I was very frustrated. And then uh, we had a visitor, Lenstra, the uh, Henrik Lenstra, not the Arian Lenstra, uh, and my my advisor told him about this work I was doing, and he said, "Oh, oh, cause very very famous problem," and he gave pointers. And then uh, there were a lot of works by mathematicians on this problem, and with very little progress towards the question I wanted. So in one second, I I moved from being stuck, no progress at all. That was great. It compares greatly with the, the state of art. With what? It compares with the greatly. state of art on that problem. Okay. And did you ever solve it? So, uh, so I, well, uh, I, I solved it partially also. The, 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 the full, the full uh, solution was uh, proven, I mean, and a few years after by Ravi Kanan. Is he in a, is he at your place? Sampath. Oh, Sampath, oh, his brother. Yeah. Ravi. So let me ask you, Hugo, you're talking about all the things you never solved. Did you ever solve something? No. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, uh, Fabrice. Is it advisable to do a postdoc before searching for a faculty or research position? Uh, I think it depends a lot on the situation. I mean, I'm from France. So in France, your PhD is only three or five years after a master's, so but still. So in France, it's kind of mandatory to do a postdoc. And I would recommend it anyway because it allows you to see a different team and different people different view of the cryptographic world but also i would recommend to also do internship during your phd so maybe if your phd is long and you have lots of internship it's unclear whether you need to do a postdoc so i guess it's really dependent on your case but i think it's important in any way to work with people which are not just your team or your advisor okay anybody else have an opinion on that question I have a strong opinion that it's good. It's a good thing to do postdoc because it's the best position in your life. It's a position that you can research most of the time without any other obligation. And one more uh, piece of advice for postdocs: try to find a postdoc that can be is a, uh, from the beginning for two years or can be easily extended because otherwise you spend your postdoc uh, searching for a job and then. The, the good thing about the postdoc is gone because you are busy and uh, stressed and all this stuff. Um, uh, what are the pros and cons between academia and industry? Craig. Um, 
Well, industry is nice uh, since you don't uh, have any teaching obligations. So I, I didn't really want to teach. So that's one reason I didn't opt for academia. Um, I just prefer doing research. Um, of course, that can be an advantage of academia if you enjoy having students. Um, otherwise, um, I don't really know. I mean, it's nice to have a, a group of people in industry with sort of a common goal. So if you're all working for the same company, maybe you have some common goals, maybe you get some direction. It's, it's nice actually to have some external motivation and direction uh, from your superiors um, sometimes if you're, uh, uh, if you're lacking your own motivation. Um, so I, I enjoy that sure. as long as it's not overbearing. Mm -hmm. So clearly both the pro and the cons of academia as students. Uh, you get to work with a lot of students, but also you have to work with a lot of students. So depending on uh, what kind of students you happen to uh, work with, uh, it could be a plus or a minus. Uh, and also depending on how personally you like working with young people that need uh, uh, direction and, and, uh, and, and such. Um, Industry pays a little better at the beginning. After a while, after that, uh, it really depends on where you where you are. Uh, yeah, I don't have too many interesting things to say about it. I mean, the the mo most of it is kind of obvious. Uh, academia, in typical cases, you have more freedom in choosing what it is that you want to work on. But you know, since you still need to bring in grants, I mean, it's not complete freedom, even if, even if formal it is. Um, so in that sense, academia might, uh, industry might be a little more directed. Than might be a little bit more what? Directed. I mean, there'll be you know, people who will try to direct your research more in, in, in industry than in academia. So again, you might like it or you might not like it, but uh, this might be a difference. Uh, other than that, I don't think that uh, research labs today are very similar to research labs at the time where I joined a research lab. So maybe my experience is not particularly relevant anymore. I, I believe so. Today, uh, uh, this in the, working in industry is as much, much less freedom academic freedom than we had uh, in, in particular in IBM. Um, but one uh, essential difference is uh, job security. University gives you job security once you have a, a, a when you have one? Tenure. Huh? Once you have tenure. Uh, and who never had tenure, he didn't need the word. <laughs> Oh, you did when you were in the Technion. Yeah, uh, I had to um, Yeah, so that that's a big that's a big thing. It's a big thing. Um, so okay, but the industry allows you to be a little bit more in touch with the practice, maybe depending on how interested you are in that. Um, you may impact uh, products and stuff that people use more easily than if you are in the university. Okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do you get grants? Team up. You what? Team up. I mean, there are things that you can do as a, as a young researcher, there is career awards and things like that. So, but that's sort of, you know, you either get it or not, you apply. They, so A, apply, but B, these kind of things, either you get it or you don't. Beyond that, team up with others. How is a young person, do you manage to team up with the people who are more likely to get the grants? Ask for them to team up with you. Uh, the, the more senior people usually will be happy to have uh, young uh, people ask, uh, asking them to or joining them 
in, in grants. I don't think that that is, is a problem in general. Um, and, and really there are all these uh, grants or awards for young researchers. Um, Do you have any advice regarding grants, whether to get a big grant or a small grant, or of course you get what you get, but what should be your strategy of how to apply for grants? For what kind of grants to go after? I assume that the multi-year one, the longer term one is better if, because then you have more time in which you don't have to apply yet to another grant. Fabrice, get ready. Time is limited. What should I focus on and what should I drop? <laughs> uh, that's a very abstract question. Uh, I guess in practicing, uh, you just uh, do what is required for the next deadline and that's unfortunate. Oh, you mean, but, oh, I see, I see, uh, I see. Uh, I don't think there is a generic answer to that. I don't see, okay, you can even scratch this whole thing. I mean, I have no idea. I don't think there is any generic answer to this question. It's up to you and what you want to do in the future. If you just want to do research in the future, obviously you may want to focus on research and try to drop uh, everything else. But if you want to be able to do other things in the future, maybe the other thing you are doing on the side are more important. So I guess it's really up to you. To decide. I don't think that's a generic answer. So what about serving on committees, reviewing papers for others and things like that? How do you balance these things out? I think there is a minimum you need to do and then there is a then it depends entirely on how much you like it and how much you want to be in these things. So definitely you need to do it and you can should uh, especially as a young person try to review. But I think many when you are young you really love to review on the end committee anyway. Uh, but uh, beyond that, I think it's just a preference, a matter of preference. Okay, and when you get older, what do you do? Does, oh, don't do like do Tal and accept every committee you I see. I do not. Yeah, don't do I like do that not. because then you regret it and then you complain to your colleague. But apart from that, <laughs> I do not accept everything. I decline most things. I accept maybe 25%. Okay. Yes, when you get older, losing your hair many years from now. I mean, yes. I have no idea. I'm not young. I'm no, not I'm young. asking other people. Well, there's a one, one generic thing about what you need to do. There are actually two generic things about what you need to do. The first one is things you enjoy and, and feel that they... It's a good investment of time. And the second one are things that you can't dodge, things that you have to do. Uh, so, you know, try to do more of the for former and less of the latter, but, you know. Uh, and that, by the way, that through, throughout your career, uh, the set of things that you enjoy might change though. Uh, and, and in general, I mean, you know, the older you are, the more, uh, <laughs> The, the more you have the privilege of saying no to, to th uh, things that people want you to do. But other than that, things don't change a whole lot in, in, in essence. But other things come along that you have to do. Yeah, you have letter more obligations. Writing, letter what? You have more obligations. Yes, yeah. letter writing, for example, something you don't have when you're young at all and you are flooded with it later. So one thing is an example. Okay, Hugo? Uh, I don't know, personal judgment. Everyone has to use their personal judgment and uh, uh, yeah, and decide by uh, what, what what they feel is the is the right thing for them to do. And how do you allocate your time between things that are work-related and things that are not work-related? Craig. Um, <clears throat> like my personal life? Well, that usually is what's meant by not work-related. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, 
I, I guess uh, my research bleeds over into my personal time and my personal time bleeds over into my research. And there's real, uh, I, I guess I could use more structure in my life, but um, um, it never seems to happen that way. <laughs> when do you prioritize personal things over work and when the other way around? Well, I guess when I have uh, work deadlines, the work becomes a priority. And when, uh, I don't know, important things come up in my personal life, I just prioritize that. I'm, I'm very good at ignoring uh, other things and just focusing on the one thing that I'm paying attention to. So, um, <laughs> so I'm, I simply decide what's uh, most important to me at the moment and I do that. <laughs> Um, anybody else want to answer that question? I'm, I'm a very non, un, undisciplined person. You're a what person? Un, undisciplined. Non-disciplined. No. Craig, un or non? Un. What? Un. Undisciplined? Okay, Google, so you're undisciplined. So what does that mean? How does that uh, exemplify itself in your oh, life? I mean, I, 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 I don't structure very much. Uh, when, 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 when you have a family and uh, then you are more, uh, more dependent uh, on, on these other, uh, other elements in, in, in your life that can take certain times in the day and you work you 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 you, you work the, um, depending on, on, on these times uh, now that i have more time i for example a half an hour before this call i sit down to finish uh, watching uh, an episode in this tv series that i'm watching now. Uh, but is this more a corona time thing or also before well it is corona because in the office i would have not uh, <laughs> uh, no i mean i could have done it right but yeah i think it's, it, it is the corona yeah yeah the corona really actually uh, uh, made these these uh, transitions between work and not work much fuzzier and now I'm going to finish the call and I will have a call with a friend of mine. It's, it's, everything is a mix, everything. But anyway, I, I don't think that this is, uh, uh, this is quite specific now. Uh, and, yeah, and, and the young students, well, no, the truth is many young students don't have a family. So I would say that uh, it, is, it is good to try to put some structure uh, in your life, uh, you know, dedicate some pre pre established times uh, to work, uh, making sure that you're doing other kind of things. Um, that's not what I do, but uh, it's a good a, a good idea to do it. What, what about what about you, Tal? What about me? Uh, how did you, what was the question exactly that you asked? How, uh, how do you allocate the time between your work and... Uh, so Tal, how do you allocate your time between your work and, and personal non-work life? So there's no question that things have shifted over time. When I was um, a young mother and I had, uh, sorry, I was not a young mother, when I had two young kids. <laughs> um, this dictated a lot of the things and I had to go home um, in preset times because I have to pick up the girls and their um, needs came first and foremost. So there was no question that that was the first priority uh, during a certain part of my um, research life. And then when they grew up, um, I love to do many things. I love to go to the theater. I love to dance. I love to eat, unfortunately. Um, so all these things, I uh, would try to allocate time. And I do give importance to these things. 
But of course, if a deadline would come around and there would be need uh, to devote uh, endless time to whatever needs to be done at that moment, then I would do that at that time. But I try to um, somehow do both things, both um, my work and my other things. And maybe it did result in me having less papers and so on, but I'm at ease with that. I'm okay with that. I feel that I've made my choices in a way that I'm happy with them. Yes, Luca? Perfect. <laughs> Couldn't be better. <laughs> Shai? I guess the same answer as the as my answer, previous answer. I mean, do the things that you like and then do the things that you can't uh, escape doing. Uh, I mean, and seriously, that's different for different people. I mean, uh, I, I also think that uh, earlier in my career, when my kids were younger and things, it was more important for me to come home at a given time and, and uh, well, maybe I had to even. Uh, uh, but, and, and, and honestly, the load, I mean, that might not be true for everyone, but the load, how much of your time you actually have available for you to do things, uh, that tends to, I mean, the load tends to grow as your career moves forward. I mean, definitely work-wise, I have a lot more things to do now than I did uh, 20 years ago, and then and, and it's, reasonably monotonically increasing um, but that's it might be just uh, you know artifact of the way i'm handling my career or, or whatever but uh, but it's definitely uh, a phenomena that as a young person maybe you don't appreciate but uh, but it, it does um, so put boundaries i guess is the, is, is the uh, uh, advice there uh, but yeah i mean the how do you partition your time between times that you're working and times that you're not working. Do the things that you enjoy uh, outside of work as long as you can afford them in terms of time. Fabrice, you're still young. But how does a young person do it? You mean balancing? I don't have a I don't know solution balancing. Either. I'm distributing. You don't need to be balanced. But I mean, as I said, before deadline, uh, you just work. And apart from that, uh, I don't have a good, good solution. Like what I know, if that can help you, uh, the way I wrote my thesis is that during the day, I would just procrastinate on doing things that are actually kind of work, but not related to my thesis. And I would start writing my thesis maybe at 6 p.m., 7 p.m., until maybe 2 a.m. for uh, several months. Of that. No, not several months, several weeks. That's how I wrote my thesis. But that's, I, that's not something I recommend, but uh, that happened, I guess. Okay, um, do you guys have anything else you want to say that you think you can add to yes. the most important, the most important uh, advice is whatever you are going through, don't think that you're the only one. Everyone is struggling, everyone is going through the same things um, before you and at the same time as you. So uh, you and after you also. <laughs> So, uh, and usually people survive and you will survive too. So we talked before what our advice is, but you know what my, really my best advice is, is to find people that you love working with oh. and that the environment will be nice and a place you want to go to. And for that, I want to say that I feel that I've been very lucky. Yeah, and I would like to add this, Dantal. Like, I think that many people ask where to go for the PhD, and definitely I've heard many people who suffered in their team because their advisor was not taking care of them, or like they had no connection with their other student in the team, or whatever. And yeah, I think I agree that for the PhD and then later in the future, the most important thing above everything else, I think, is the, that you are in a team which you are happy to work with. Otherwise, it just becomes like so much more difficult. I, I, actually, I never experienced it. So I'm lucky about that, but I've heard many people experiencing it and I, I don't even understand like 
why I mean that's terrible what you are living and just, yes but I, it's very difficult to know how things will be before coming so that's why you may want to do internship before starting a, a PhD I don't know if it's possible in the US but it's what we do in France and the same for postdoc if you know the team before it can help and to see if you like fit it with it or not uh, so you know wherever you are try to find people that you like working with uh, and or people that you just like spending time with. if it's the same people even better yeah. uh, by the uh, way in the in academia people work much less with the the professors work much less with each other than for example uh, we do or uh, I mean, everyone works with their students and much less among themselves. So, uh, so it's important to be in a place that you like and the, uh, you know, relationships are good. But uh, as for finding the people that you are going to work with in academia, it's mostly with your students. I, I think that people are more outside also collaborate and of course we we were a team but i think that when i look around papers many times are written between peers that collaborate and not yeah but very 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 uh, seldom are people that are in the same department even yeah, people that used to collaborate before they join the same department they stop uh, uh, <laughs> Collaborating, yes, yes. I mean, it, it's a, it's an amazing thing. I, I, I don't know what uh, leads to that, but uh, that that's quite a, a, a constant. So, so I, if you actually are, are 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 tired of collaborating with someone, join the safety part. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm that happy. No, 